Hello, everyone, and welcome to Classical Revolution here on iDagio. My name is Rachel Fenlon, and this is my weekly series in which I get the great pleasure of chatting with guests in the classical music world about what risk taking is in classical music and how they themselves push boundaries as classical musicians. Today, I'm joined by Vito Jurai. Vito is a composer with a unique and powerful contemporary voice. His works have been commissioned by the New York Philharmonic, the BBC Symphony Orchestra, the Radio Symphony Orchestra Stuttgart, Ensemble Modern, Ensemble Contemporain, the NDR uh, Orchestra um, at the Elbe Philharmonie, and at prestigious festivals, including the Salzburger Festspiele. He is the recipient of the Claudio Abado Composition Prize from the Berlin Philharmonic, as well as a resident at the um, prestigious Villa Massimo. He is currently, since 2015, a professor of composition and theory at the University of Ljubljana. Um, and I'm really thrilled to meet him for the first time today and welcome him on the show. Hi, Vito. Thank you, hi. Thanks for, thanks for joining me here. So nice to have, have you on the show. Um, I'd love to begin by just asking you what your earliest musical memories are and whether you feel there are particular moments that jump out to you that have been really important for you musically? The earliest memories. I mean, the, the earliest I can remember is that uh, when I was very young, I think like five or six years old, I, I couldn't feel asleep. And I just woke up and start, start playing the piano. I mean, playing the piano, just touching the keys and seeing what comes out. Uh, and then my parents, uh, probably saw some potential in those first tries that I don't know. And they encouraged me to start playing piano. Uh, my father is a composer as well. I mean, he studied composition in Slovenia, in Ljubljana. And then um, he, he was teaching at, at uh, secondary schools and now is, uh, um, <clears throat> is leading some choirs and uh, a lot of traditional Slovenian music with, with them. Uh, but he was the person who really encouraged me uh, mm. to, to search uh, for myself in, in, in the music. So not, not only playing the notes, uh, but listening and then playing. Like for example, lead, uh, um, switching on the radio and just trying to play songs I hear on the radio. Back then, uh, internet was not available, so it was my ear which led me through the music, so it's how I began. Interesting. And um, what sort of led you to composition exactly? Where did that first impulse come to compose something or that you felt you might be a composer? Yeah, when, I mean, after, after playing, um, simple pieces of music at, at the piano lessons. I was just wondering, guy, like uh, playing an etude by Czerny, and that's just thinking I could do, I could compose something more interesting, you know. <laughs> so then trying, <laughs> well, <laughs> trying to develop. <laughs> I mean, you know, like like a child which uh, yeah. who tries different things, like like essentially playing with, with, with possibilities. Uh, so this is uh, how I have started being creative, creative and just trying one chord and another and then combining them, uh, trying to play melody. And then uh, it, this, is, this is how my first piano pieces were born. They sounded pretty much like Chopin. I mean, whatever, like eight, nine years, years old. And <clears throat> of course, you try to, 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 to imitate composers uh, who know, like in my age, then you know, Chopin, Fauré. I was playing cello as well. Uh, I started six years later than with the piano. And with cello, because I played uh, <clears throat> some simple stuff by Bach. I mean, Bach is never simple, but there are uh, some some pieces which are simpler than the others. And then my first cello pieces were like something like Bach. You know, you have to begin it somewhere. And then upon beginning my studies at the uh, music academy in 
Ljubljana. Then <clears throat> I started working more systematically, of course. Right, yeah. Oh, wow. So you played the piano and cello. That's, that's so helpful as a composer, too. Um, what was your, um, who were your biggest um, kind of musical influences as a young composer or like mentors even? Um, you you mean you mean teachers or, or teachers or even teachers or even composers that really kind of influenced you, as, particularly as you were finding your own like unique voice um, as a composer. I mentioned my father, who was always guiding me and trying to present me music on on, on one place like then, and I think he was one of the early discmans by by Sony. <clears throat> Uh, so he had like some of first c CDs. I, I I remember that. I think one of the earliest uh, discmans he bought kind of exploded the table, <laughs> like in like a cartoon. <laughs> so that's another memory. <clears throat> and uh, um, like I mentioned, Bach and Chopin, were like my my favorites back then. Um, <clears throat> I remember my cello teacher Vladimir Kocic, who, uh, who was like encouraging me to think differently uh, when playing cello than when playing the piano. Uh, and I was always kind of dreaming, yeah, I, I will be composer, I will compose some orchestral pieces and uh, maybe some opera and having big ambitions. And, but like, uh, I didn't really start with the contemporary music, which, I mean, um, <clears throat> the scene which I belong to now, because in, uh, it was um, difficult to listen to it. I mean, uh, to hear it in a concert in Slovenia back then. Right. And uh, then when entering the Academy of, of, of Music, then like slowly the 20th century uh, opened to me. And so I started learning. Right. Um, you you incorporate a lot of um, electronics into your work, um, and I was I imagine that the technology of this is something that's always evolving. So it's probably evolved so much since you kind of began. Um, and I I'm curious about what your relationship with that is like. Do you feel you're always kind of with that, trying to push the limits of electronics in your work, and and how? Yeah, I think that's a very complex topic. Uh, yeah, I started doing electronics in Dresden, where I was doing my Erasmus exchange study, and afterwards the uh, postgraduate studies of, of composition. Study of electronics. Uh, I mean, um, the study of electronic music in. In Slovenia back then was not was not possible because there was no equipment. I mean, this is, this is a right. um, expensive equipment. <clears throat> you need stuff for it, and uh, I was actually lucky because uh, when applying to to Dresden, I I didn't know about uh, their studio for electronic uh, music, and I was I was very excited to start exploring it, and for me. Um, it, I understood it's kind of extension of thinking as, a, as, an, as an instrumentalist. So electronics can produce sounds which analog instruments cannot. And uh, but there is kind of um, feedback on that. So upon composing my first uh, piece with electronics, which was a piece for piano and electronics, um, I got many ideas how to transform my instrumental music. And this process mm -hmm. is, it's, is still going on. I regard electronic music as um, a field which re requires a lot of attention. So for me, composing something for electronics and instruments is like composing two pieces because it's like mm -hmm. double work. In the case, I have to program uh, all, all, the, all the batches. Uh, so it, it is very, it is always very intensive phase of working when I'm uh, trying to produce electronic sounds. Right. And, and where do those two um, 
sort of musically. So I, I, that's so interesting to think of it as like almost two fields that are like, that are meeting inside of peace. Um, for you, what, what kind of joins them together? What's the meeting point um, between that sort of um, acoustic or analog and electronic that like sort one of- way, like <clears throat> One way would be to, I mean, to, to search for similarities. Uh, mm -hmm. But there's also the other way of uh, joining un unjoinables, you know. So it's um, it can it can be interesting to have like two layers which which collide. Right. right. So it depends uh, of of the concept. When I remember my first piece, I uh, actually recorded the piano sounds. My former teacher <clears throat> Lothar Volklander in in Dresden encouraged me to be very mm -hmm. precise with that. Mm -hmm. uh, not only producing sounds on, on the keyboard, but as well inside uh, the piano. I hit a huge library of, of sounds and then I tried to transform them with, with granular synthesis and uh, other practices I, <clears throat> I got and extended or, or some of them I built by myself because it was like the first tries. Right. Um, and yeah, this, uh, so the first, the first piece had kind of singular source. And uh, my studies uh, went on in, uh, in, uh, in Karlsruhe. So uh, University of Music in Karlsruhe has a, a very large studio for electronic music, which is called Com Computer Studio, mm -hmm. with many rooms, excellent equipment. And there I produced uh, most of my works. Uh, mostly back then, what what is uh, like so-called tape pieces, so pre-composed pieces for um, electronics, mainly eight channels, where we're just uh, sitting in the studio recording, um, putting piece, uh, putting sounds to, together. And live electronic, um, I met later uh, mm -hmm. when I had the opportunity to work with Experimental Studio in Freiburg. Okay. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about live electronics. Um, I, well, I think also because I love working with them. And um, yeah, I sort of wanted to just hear what, what the advantage of, or what you feel, how, how do we, you interact as a composer differently with live electronics? Um, what do they embody for you? Yeah, that's, a, <clears throat> that's an interesting question. It's, uh, I think there are so many answers to, to that. Yeah. Uh, my personal opinion is that uh, um, with live electronics, they are much, more question marks so it it uh, it depends on the performer on the acoustics of the concert hall on on the technique on on microphones uh, what you actually hear upon giving the initial signal so uh, you get surprised much more without with live electronics uh, it's for me it's more is 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 more improvising uh, character than like really composing, you know, like a, when, when there is one composing string quartet and setting notes, I would compare it to uh, with composing an electronical piece mm. uh, in Pro Tools session when you just set your sounds, putting them together. But with live electronics, uh, is, it is a different principle than, than their processes rather than uh, material in traditional sense, like harmony, you know, uh, melody process give, gives you other dimensions to work with, mm -hmm. and it and it's very refreshing. Yeah, I like I like the description of that. Actually, it's it's um, definitely I can relate with that as a performer. Um, do you? Uh, do you collect sounds as a composer when you I mean, particularly about with electronics, but also just in general, I know um, some composers sort of, if you hear a sound, you kind of collect it or you dictate it or you record it. What's your kind of experience with, <clears throat> with sound in your daily life? Uh, you mean connected to the live electronics or just in general? No, just in general. Oh, I mean, okay. Yeah. Um, I am uh, um, I, I'm somebody who reacts to sound rather than reacting to a, a piece of paper uh, with with notes uh, written on it. Mm -hmm. So I am <clears throat> if I if I choose 
to listen to the score or to read the score, I prefer listening to the score because yeah. that touches me. Therefore, I am a, uh, I'm a big fan uh, of, of visiting concerts, which hit me hard last year because we there were uh, nearly no concerts. And I, that impulse and working with life, uh, life with, with musicians, that, that uh, was, that were things I was, I was really missing. Uh, so I don't, I don't collect sounds uh, in a sense of recording and storing them, but rather uh, memorizing an, an experience uh, and then transforming it. Uh, hmm. They're like, I mean, there are many stories about, I mean, people sometimes ask you, how do you compose? And <laughs> that's a question when I think, I mean, yeah, there could be more interesting questions as well. But uh, there's a picture of the composer coming to the forest, you know, hearing the birds and, and, and the bees and stuff. And then this is how the uh, inspiration comes. And some teachers said, this is the only way how the inspiration can, can come. I don't know. So, I think every composer is different in, 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 in that sense. So I personally like uh, going to uh, to take a walk in the, in, in the nature, um, rather like a kind of creative work, uh, uh, walk, not for listening to the birds and, and, and being systematic in, in, in that way. Yeah. Um, as an example, I remember when I was working on my first piece in Experimental Studio in Freiburg, yeah. in SVR, and it was a piece for um, a alto singer, a small ensemble and live electronics, and violoncello, which I took to the studio, was one of was one of uh, main instruments for my piece. Mm -hmm. And I programmed kind of control frequency for some intervals uh, okay. and playing uh, uh, some other sounds on, on the cello, which this, this frequency was supposed to control in some way. It's uh, too complicated to, to explain. But uh, somehow the, there was a very, uh, it was an unexpected feedback in a, in a lot speaker, which was very, very interesting. So I just <clears throat> asked uh, the sound engineer Gregorio who was helping me, please don't move, just record it. It's fantastic. And Great. that was a very strong impulse. Yeah. I took from that uh, working session, analyzed it, and then resynthesized it as a kind of uh, um, scale or let, let, let's say process of um, modified intervals. Mm -hmm. So this was kind of strong, um, auditive impression, which got me <clears throat> and, I had, and, and I had to react it in many of my pieces uh, <clears throat> from then on uh, contained this material. Interesting. Wow. So it's sort of, there's an openness to, um, well, I mean, to whatever you're interacting with and if it sparks something for you. And exactly, exactly. <clears throat> That's the yeah. um, that's <clears throat> that connects to one topic I I very like uh, I very much like to mention, which is mm -hmm. the field of, of creativity. Uh, when I uh, when I was a fellow at the German Academy Villa Massimo in mm -hmm. Rome, yeah, I stumbled upon <clears throat> a video on YouTube where the British uh, um, actor and writer John Cleese, which uh, you know I'm sure speaks about creativity, about the process, very scientifically. It's, it's, it's not a sketch. Mm -hmm. I think it was a, uh, he was asked to speak about creativity to managers. But the, uh, the facts <clears throat> he collected there uh, are very convincing. And I started to regard a process of creativity as, as, a, as a very important process uh, at, at itself. Not just saying being creative, but what actually is happening there. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, um, like the, the, the surprise with the sound in Freiburg, mm -hmm. it is something uh, uh, that, that um, the ear is open to ideas, like, you know, like yes. a, 
kid playing in, in the sand, you know? Yes. You can build castles or doing a car, uh, just playing with possibilities. There is nothing wrong you can do. Yeah. Everything yeah. can lead to a very nice uh, result at the end. <clears throat> so I, I like being uh, exposed to that kind of uh, impulses. And I, no, I, I love that. I, I also read a great a great quote of yours where you talk about. Um, I'm going to paraphrase it, but it's about sort of um, being a creative artist is being um, sort of in charge of the architecture of your uh, something process or <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly, yes, yes. <laughs> so I, I should have written it down, but I didn't. Um, but I, that really stood out to me as well, and I think it's exactly. Um, as artists, we have to ask ourselves exactly that, what actually is creativity and how, um, I think it's also so individual for us, right? Yeah, and so it should be. Understanding yourself. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I would love to ask you about, so I, something I like talking about in the show is sort of what, like what risk-taking is for us. And of course, when I have performers on the show, we talk about, um, what happens when you're taking risks as performers and often it's you know that feeling of being on stage in the moment and you know thinking you're going to explode or something um, as a composer how does risk tra uh, risk taking translate to you um, what we, yeah what is for you taking risks in your work or um, yeah as a composer or challenging yourself or what do you think about this yeah, I mean it's um, it's a very it's a very complex topic as well. So, yeah. what is risk in which field? I mean, it is uh, is it for a composer to compose a note which is too high to be played on an instrument with a regular, beautiful orchestral gesture sound, you know, or it is maybe <clears throat> um, composing in style which the audience is not going to like. You know, the, the, those are fears composers sometimes are, are um, confronted. I, I personally don't, I don't like to think uh, of audience as a one complex, you know, like, you know, have to write for this audience, for this audience. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's a, it's a um, combination, it's a combination of in individuals. So everybody listens differently according to their ex experience and, uh, and associations. So if I, if I would be thinking on everybody there, that I would probably compose very few notes. <clears throat> you know? yeah. uh, so I wouldn't consider uh, this taking a risk. Risk can be, I mean, like obviously not respecting the, the deadline. <clears throat> That's always a risk. Yeah, yeah. yeah. okay. This is kind of a, a collision between composers and organizers because there are two time dimensions which cannot um, end up in the same universe. Right. Because my my time is uh, getting an idea, setting notes together, polishing the result, mm -hmm. and I could do this for a very long time. But some sometimes the piece has to be finished because the concert date is there. Yes. Uh, which changed a little bit last year. We all know, unfortunately. <clears throat> uh, but in general, uh, I would sometimes need less time, but most of our, our, our composers would need more time. So mm -hmm. the the time layer of composer and of the organizer crosses somewhere. <laughs> And, uh, but that would be kind of technical risk. I mean, um, um, maybe the, the biggest risk would be not, not, not being myself. This, this I wouldn't like to do. Like, you know, sell my soul to the devil because somebody wants me to compose that way and I have to be like that, 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 that. I mean, that's, uh, that's something um, I, I would not do. Yeah. Uh, and, it, it is it is easier to say than than do some sometimes you know mm -hmm. if you know a composer wants to choose a very crazy instrumentation and then at the end you get a string quartet so then you have to limit your thoughts to, to something else <clears throat> there are also technical risks i um i think the most risky um undertaking i i had to do was 
2016, yeah. um, the 2015, I got the commission uh, to compose a piece for two orchestras and two conductors. Uh, it was for the 30th anniversary of Kölner Philharmonie. And uh, when composing for more than one orchestra, uh, it is automatically interesting to play with different tempos and you know trying to explore possibilities there we all know um, group by stockhausen and that's a uh, kind of piece which sets margins to uh, so you know this piece and then 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 you say what do i want to do with that uh, so <clears throat> my my goal was to to control those two orchestras uh, uh, regarding tempo and writing is it in the score so like calculating the bars, like when an orchestra plays uh, the first tempo and the other orchestra plays the other tempo, then the measures would be differently wide. Mm -hmm. Then I have to, to calculate when the conductors can come together or not. Right. Uh, and my goal was, uh, because I work with the finale and notation program, yeah. to um, produce this piece and as one single file for the score with all the tempo changes for both orchestras and, and parts. Uh, so I had to be very careful, uh, like how to set the score initially mm. is going to hold together at the end. Uh, so this was, this was risky, but I have done some, um, some studies before. So right. uh, getting lucky at the end, let, let's tell you that. Yeah. Um, yeah, certainly. <laughs> I I know you you deal or, or you kind of um, yeah I suppose you deal with like a lot of kind of spatial um, awareness in your work and there's a theatrical or there can be theatrical components to your work and so naturally I know and you've also composed um, opera as well and um, so a question that very naturally comes up for me is just to talk with you about what you feel kind of music theater and opera is in the 21st century and kind of what the strengths of opera are, um, how you yourself feel about, about opera and composing the modern opera, for example. Yeah, I mean, that, uh, speaking of, of, of composing for stage, it is a different story than it was 100 years ago. Yeah. Uh, considering large scale, I mean, Hundred years and more, like large scale works by Richard Wagner or Richard Strauss with huge orchestras, three, four hours at length. Uh, it is not very common to do that in, in these days. There are long operatic pieces, uh, like pieces by Hector Parra, for example. Uh, but it's um, uh, composers, I think, uh, discovered and so did the organizers and interpreters, then uh, in using smaller ensembles and electronics and uh, very, um, I would say, carefully selected combination of singers, you can produce marvelous works. So it does have to be eight, eight French horns and 12 double basses to actually produce a, 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 a really operatic work. Mm. Uh, so, <clears throat> I mean, it is not, um, let's not say that uh, this form with a big orchestra and the long scale, that, that, that's, that's kind of history. It's not. It's one of the possibilities. I think it's one among possibilities. Uh, of course, it's, it's hugely de de uh, demanding to get all these people together. Um, I, was, I was particularly impressed in 2019, uh, by the um, work Last Call by Michael uh, Pelzel in Zurich, that was um, a uh, music theater for mm -hmm. small group of singers and small group of instrumentalists, very uh, delicately selected um, what composer wanted to do with instruments, and there was electronics too. Uh, for me, one of the best examples what you can do with uh, with very with, with with limited human 
resources. Uh, so um, I would love to compose for like a big opera, for big orchestra, but as well, I would be very, very much interested to do uh, something with you know, 20 musicians or less um, incorporating all the aforementioned um, possibilities. And, and how, how is it for you um, with librettists and dealing with text as a composer? Um, yeah, I think every composer has sort of a different process with text. Um, and I know you've also written some, some songs as well. Um, how, how are you influenced by text as a composer when you're writing for the voice? I prefer to, um, to work with a librettist uh, rather than taking existing literature. Mm-hmm. I mean, both can, can be in, in, in interesting. It's, of course, I mean, if you take a, a, a sonnet by Shakespeare or, or some, other, some other existing high quality literature, uh, then of course the quality is confirmed, you can do something with it. But you cannot you cannot transform it. You, you have to take it as a as a relic of the past, and <laughs> and carry it carry this kind of uh, um, aura with it. But uh, when working with with a living person, which I love, uh, yeah. be it interpreter or librettist, yeah. that is what what enriches me uh, because there is a discussion. There are many hours of just talking, you know, creating ideas, polishing ideas, mm-hmm. working together. Mm-hmm. And uh, that way, most of, uh, of texts were born, which I used for my, my compositions with Libertis, Galton Stockinger, Patrick Hahn, um, uh, the latest um, is for Choir and Orchestra der Verwandler I have done with Alex Steger, my fellow Slovenian. Uh, we were living in Ljubljana both at the same time. It had a lot of ex- exchange. His, his uh, poetry is um, very compact. You know, he can express a lot with a couple of syllables. Mm. And then uh, I needed uh, his voice and his explanations multiple times that it really got into me and got, got something uh, out of me, which you could put on the paper. And like reading um, texts which are being written, comparing to some which already exists, it, 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 there's so many associations going on. Uh, <clears throat> I, I, I can just feel my brain and uh, my brain and my heart uh, going uh, very hot. <laughs> yeah. And I, I suppose that also kind of draws on that creativity process for you as well. Like it sounds that it, it feeling collaborative is a really strong thing for you as well. But yes. Yeah. Um, c- because also you you work quite collaboratively, or you write specifically for musicians and ensembles, and yeah. That is very important for me, uh, just to 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 see what uh, I mean when working with the interpreter. Uh, to uh, experience all, um, let's say, uh, to, uh, to to get in, to get inspired by his experience. I mean, mm-hmm. um, musicians like uh, my dear friends of Ensemble Modern, they were uh, playing new sounds and exploring for decades. So, uh, speaking about data bank of sounds. Yeah, that is yeah. something. Yeah, uh, exactly. Although they're, they're not saved on a hard drive, but they are inside the musicians, yeah. inside the instrument. So, yeah. um, and if this is an instrument I don't play, and, and, and I don't play most of instruments, that's 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 that, that's the collision I need. I start uh, the first time I I did that was uh, with the um, with the French horn player ensemble modern Sar mm-hmm. Berger. Uh, we have been cooperating since I was a, a fellow at the International Sound Modern Academy. Mm-hmm. And there were like five years of uh, experimenting with different mutes, uh, what the right hand can do, uh, or the wolves can do different horn types, Wagner tuba as well. 
And so after five years and being like, uh, you know, getting this, um, stepping over this, let's say, uh, um, time of risk into, mm -hmm. into, into, um, into a layer of being confident, then I could uh, produce the concerto for French horn, which I proposed mm -hmm. for him. And uh, then we, we knew what is the material we are, we are working with. Yeah, and you're not limited because you've exactly. had experimentation. It's funny, myself as a performer, I, I'm just reflecting that I can really, from the other side, so I perform a lot of new, new music for exactly this reason and commission composers for exactly this reason in that um, they show me things in my instrument that I didn't know I had, or either as a singer or as a pianist. And that's super interesting. And it keeps, it influences all the other music. So that influences for me Schubert and everything, you know? So it's, it's cool to, to see it from the other side as well. Um, so, I mean, something I definitely, I definitely want to ask you is, I mean, we're talking at it such a, as such a specific time. I mean, um, there's never been a time like this and it's been just completely surreal and there are no words really for, for this time. Um, and I'm curious how it's, um, what you have been able to sort of question in yourself differently in this time, or have you questioned sort of your, anything about your work or your process in a different way, sort of because this a time allows that space? Yeah, that's, um, that's a question. That's a question um, I, get, um, I get asked from many persons. Mm. Um, but it's, a, it's difficult to, to, to answer because it are, uh, I mean, although very little is, uh, very little happened concert-wise in last year, a lot of things happened in the mind, you know, mindsets changed. Exactly. Um, because I'm also a um, professor for composition, mm -hmm. it means uh, that the amount of being working at the computer as a composer was doubled mm -hmm. uh, because I had to uh, work over video conferencing as well with all of my students, yeah. which made me tired. Uh, as, and then while reading studies in internet, it is because you're like concentrating on very small dots on, on the screen and, and uh, uh, you have to read all the responses from a very small source and that, that consumes a lot of energy. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so I was, uh, while being artist in, in residence at the International Artist House Villa Concordia in Bamberg, I had uh, <clears throat> time to go to the nature, to explore the forest, to go away from the computer mm. uh, and try to think, to, to think differently. Um, I'm speaking about the, the creative process again. Mm -hmm. And while it was very hard being creative, like, you know, after a, uh, every morning of, of teaching and doing other uh, administrative work over Zoom and then going to the same computer back to put mm -hmm. uh, like to transform my musicals, my, my musical ideas into uh, note heads. Yeah. Uh, so I, I tried to, to, to do some, some different approach. Um, and mm -hmm. I, like I mentioned before, I missed all the live, all, all, all the impulses uh, from concerts. Yeah. Uh, so one has to create other influences. Yeah, uh, true. And, uh, and maybe, I mean, I was, um, there was a time where I was working on, it was not about, not because of Corona, but there were projects uh, um, piling up, which uh, were um, like transforming existing compositions. 
So this was a little bit of luck for me because I could uh, shut down a little bit of this uh, creative process, mm -hmm. uh, which would be very difficult uh, to do uh, while being very tired of all this zooming stuff. And uh, therefore, I was mentioning back to the nature, walks with bicycle to, to actually um, open my, my mind again. Uh, okay. And then, then like start <clears throat> the process of creativity from the core, which yeah. is when I shortly mentioned the, <clears throat> um, the I'll say, complex of theories uh, John Cleese, tells mm -hmm. about it in, 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 in his lecture. Mm -hmm. It's about um, <clears throat> being able to forget uh, the like um, everyday things, like, you know, going shopping, writing emails, but just concentrating more of developing ideas. And for doing that, um, there will be like five different factors. Uh, five um, five things to be um, to consciously um, um, uh, work with. So and 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 uh, let's say uh, five factors you you need to to become creative and and to stop just messing around with everyday activity activities. The first would be the space. <clears throat> um, in, I mean, in order to create like a space and time. Oasis. At first, you need time and space only for that. So, space could be atelier where working, taking a walk, swimming. I don't know what. Some somewhere where, where an artist or the creative person feels mm -hmm. confident and not disturbed. Mm -hmm. And then um, it is it is a very it is very useful to, to define how long you want to be in this creative process. Like how long to to be playing with the ideas, because it is it is like people say like playing around, but it's like a it's like a child uh, playing with possibilities. Nothing is is wrong. Anything can lead to something very useful, but a a play begins and play ends. Otherwise, it's not it's not it's not a play. <laughs> so some somewhere you have stopped fantasizing with ideas and actually transforming ideas into reality. <laughs> So therefore, this second factor time uh, limited for animal. Mm -hmm. Some people need one hour, some some half an hour. It is very individual. Mm -hmm. um, the the third the third um, factor would be time as well, but it's a different dimension of time. It is uh, it is uh, the time span. Um, <clears throat> it 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 means how long um, is the creative person prepared to delay the final decision. Uh, about being finished with uh, a process to not to be happy too soon. Okay. Because sometimes you work. I mean, as well, if you are if you are practicing, I can imagine on the piano. Then, yeah. uh, if you're practicing for eight hours, then you think, oh, I am finished. I don't. Uh, I don't want to. I want to be finished, but something tells you, I'm. It, it's still. It's still way. Uh, it's um, it's still some room for improvement, so you have to take another time slot to finish it. Mm -hmm. So that that's, that's time span, and there were many many ex experiments done um, about this 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 topic in in the field of architecture. Uh, oh. That the architects uh, which were able to delay the decision to play longer with ideas were actually they came up with uh, more original ideas than. Yeah. The others, which uh, said, "Okay, I'm finished before. I'm 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 too confident, too soon." Yeah. Uh, and to uh, I mentioned confidence. That's the fourth one. Uh, so being confident uh, means not being afraid of 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 mistake, because everything everything is right. Why playing with ideas? <laughs> When you limit yourself, you say, "Okay, I just can. I, I I just have to play with this octave." Okay, then it, you can get some material to work, but you 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 would be able to see something, something crazy, which would at the end maybe lead you to something uh, even <clears throat> even better. Uh, so yeah, uh, no mistakes. Just 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 have a go. No. 
but still then you can uh, you can get um, stuck yes. and, don't, uh, and, and you don't come forward and then you need to kind of reset but you know uh, John Cleese tells that the humor which would be natural for mm-hmm. his uh, occupation I like the, the the humor as well but some people would just jump into the cold river or, or take a bike yeah. trip for two days just to to, to get a head clear and then uh then the brain and the heart are being reactivated mm-hmm. and new new air to produce something more more creative and that's so that's the fifth one is that yes. reset yeah, i mean humor yeah. reset something something different release something yeah release exactly yeah i love that i'm <laughs> I'm going to write that down after <laughs> after this conversation. <laughs> yeah, that's that's super. I mean, that's exactly. And I love that it kind of revolves around um playfulness because um I mean, yeah, my translation of that is is um that it, your spirit can be so free, right? Your yeah, your whatever you want to call it, but it's there's a freedom there. So I, I love that. But you you're organizing the freedom. Some giving it boundaries (laughs) um Vito it's been it's been so great to have you have you on the show and and chat with you and hear and hear your thoughts I could talk to you for probably another hour but I guess we're running out of time it's my pleasure um I would I would love to ask you kind of um my final question which would be you know the the title of the show is classical revolution um and I'm curious how you feel um how and when can music be revolutionary? Revolutionary, I mean, it's uh, um, music being revolutionary, it means that a certain amount of population has to get in touch with it, uh, which uh, reduces chances of contemporary music being that significant, uh, unfortunately. For now. Uh, because we're not speaking of, of millions and billions, yeah. but uh, we, we yeah. count sometimes the members of the family, you know, and <laughs> especially in, in times of, of Corona. So we have to be present in, in uh, like, you know, on, on, on digital media. Uh, so, mm-hmm. I mean, that's, that's the point how we technically uh, reach more, more, more population to be revolutionary. I mean, you can be revolution, revolutionary uh, in, in your own field, maybe for, for uh, the circle of people you're working with. You can be re- revolutionary for yourself as well. If you, I know, if as a composer, I have done something successfully I have not been able to do before, then I just mm-hmm. feel revolutionary uh, because I finally managed it. Mm-hmm. But I, I, I suppose your question was like how how, how music would uh, would change the the society. Yeah. Yes. Um, the society or yeah or the people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's uh, uh, many composer going political. Uh, it's always the question about um, about the, the relation between uh, the um, the message. And mm-hmm. the quality of music as well. Uh, I think both have to be there. They're not always both yeah. there. I would not extend this this, this discussion at this point. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, I mean, if you, if you would ask a child about revolutionary things in music, they would for sure mention the famous Etude by Chopin, or the name of Tchaikovsky would fall as well. So we. So we are generally speaking about 19th century, you know, um, mm. like in the in the 21st century, what could be a revolutionary? So it it is a it is a question: What do you want to improve? Uh, what what is the topic? Uh, is it now? Obviously, the topic is Corona, and many artists reacting on that with some very original re- results. But it is not the only problem in the world. People are acting that that's the only di- disease in the world. 
Um, apart of the medical problem, the only problem of the world, we have a lot of other problems. Like, you know, uh, Fu um, Fukushima is kind of topic of the past, but uh, I would be very careful to eat any fish from, from the Pacific Ocean. And uh, there is a there is a topic which actually touched me uh, because of my father. You see, I'm I'm coming back like to the middle, like a big A B A form. You know, what? my father uh, he is a beekeeper. Wow. Yes, and that brought me and um, that brought me in contact with the nature, and also living a lot in the cities now because of my profession. I'm still, I still feel connected to that. And my next orchestra piece will be connected to the topic about the extinction of, extinction of insects. Mm -hmm. Because that's, that's a huge problem. People underestimate that. I mean, you don't read about that uh, like in front pages of newspapers. But like driving through the landscape, uh, to the village with a car 20 years ago, uh, a lot of insects on yeah. the windscreen, every, every colors which can be a disgusting view, but now they're none. So it means they are, they're not so many there anymore and we, we need them. Uh, that's a topic yeah. to, to tackle. Uh, yeah. I cannot promise that my piece is going to change that and, and, and bring all the dead insects back, uh, but having faith that I can contribute something to this problem, that is uh, what but I think, uh, I mean, like the, the mindset, I want to change so, something. Mm -hmm. uh, if this is answer to, to your question, being revolutionary, I mean, it's, 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 it's not really the, it's, it's, it's not, not really a re revolution, but, but kind of uh, let's think differently. Let's, let's do something to, to bring a change. Yes. Yeah, exactly. And I, I like that that right away the question is, well, what needs to improve? And then and then you make it personal, for, like, for example, yeah. uh, that you take it to, to your your father and that story there. Um, yeah, that's that's very interesting. Thank you so much for, for, this, for this inspiring conversation today. Um, Thank you for inviting me, it was a pleasure. My pleasure. And I wish you, um, so you're f finishing up the last, week or the second last week of your residency in Bamberg. Yes, yes, it is, uh, yeah. I'm, I'm counting of days. Uh, wow. Well, it was a very special time here. It's, yeah. it, it still is. And I'm, yeah. I'm, going, to, I, I'm going to use every second of it. <laughs> I hope, well, you, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I hope you enjoy that every last second of it and, um, and wishing you all the best and hope we meet in person one day. <laughs> that would be great. I, I wish you all the best too. Thank you. And thanks again for inviting me. Thanks. And thank you everyone for tuning in and see you again next Wednesday.